I'm afraid the last lecture is going to be a bit of a letdown. We're going to do one technical proof, which we're going to skip some details of, and then that's going to be it. The course, I think the high point of the course already happened a couple of weeks ago, or maybe last week with the, the Shatton class stuff. This last week's just winding down. You know, you go for a run, you have to cool down at the end, or your muscles break down. This is the cool down of the course. The last theorem we're going to do is the Quapian theorem, which I've mentioned a couple of times. And as I say, every time I write this name, I don't know if the accent on the end is correct. I think it's the one that goes down and not the one that goes up. I don't know how these names work. It's not French anyway, so. Okay, so you know the theorem, let X be a Banach space, a complex. No, we don't need to be complex, just a Banach space. Because it's the last lecture, I'm actually gonna write everything in full for once. Let X be a Banach space with Rada marker, type and cotype, two. So the best possible Rada marker type and cotype that you can have. And this happens in particular when X has Fourier type two. So when you have a Poincaré theorem, these assumptions are satisfied. And X is isomorphic to a Hilbert space. And as I've said, the real significance of this theorem says you have no hope of having a Poincaré theorem without this strong geometric assumption on your Banach space. And as I said in lecture one, this justifies in a sense, the whole field, if you want to call it a field of Banach valued analysis, like you know your fundamental tools of Fourier analysis don't work in general Banach spaces. This is what really tells you that you have to use sophisticated techniques. You're not going to Poincaré your way out of every hole. So, we want to prove this and the proof is interesting there's a couple of proofs we're actually going to prove something stronger actually something much stronger but the proof isn't that difficult okay it's a bit difficult but let's just do it we have to start with the definition given a real vector space v interesting thing about this proof is a lot of it has nothing to do with Banach spaces it's really a proof about real vector spaces no norms just linear structure. Given a real vector space V and a subset A of V, just a subset, not a subspace, the cone over A, which you might've seen before, is the set of all finite linear combinations, alpha N, V, N in the vector space, such that these coefficients alpha I are all non-negative, real non-negative numbers and the vectors V sub N are in the subset A. So it's like a span, but you only take positive coefficients. The idea is like if, you, if you're in R2 or something like that and you have a, a set like this, then the cone is this set. So you're really generating a cone from a given set. No negative coefficients, that's the important thing. So we have a key lemma dealing with cones, which is if you suppose A and B are subsets of a real vector space, I should say our subsets of a real vector space. And if these sets A and B generate V in the following sense, V is the cone of B minus the cone over A. You're not ever gonna really expect V to be the cone of B, but it could be the difference between two cones to allow for some negative coefficients. If V is the cone of B minus the cone of A, oh, well, we're supposing that. Let's let F be a function from A to the real line and G a function from B to the real line. These are just functions. No assumptions on the functions. Then the following are equivalent. I hope people write TFAE for the following are equivalent. It's too long of a sentence. So property one, there exists a linear map, capital Phi from V to the real line. So a functional. Nothing about continuity because this is just a real vector space. There's no norms, there's no continuity. It's just a linear function on V. 
such that f of a is less than or equal to phi of a for all a in the set capital A. And g of b is greater than or equal to phi of b for all b in capital B. This is the first property. In the proof that we're going to do for Quapien's theorem, we're going to deduce this from property two. We're going to pull out the existence of a linear functional. The thing that's equivalent to that, that we're going to show at one point in our proof, is that you have this inequality alpha n f a n is less than or equal to the sum. I have to quantify over everything in a moment. Beta m g b m for all sequences a dot b dot alpha dot beta dot where everything is where it should be. The vectors a are in a, the vectors b are in b, and these are just real numbers. I haven't said whether they need to be positive or not. They do need to be positive, but not negative at least. So the existence of such a linear map, whoops. Yeah. Okay, I can't highlight today, or can I? Yep. The existence of such a linear map that dominates F and is dominated by G in this sense comes from this inequality on all sequences of vectors in A and B, which is a bit cryptic. It's like, I, I can't say I really understand what this inequality means, but in some sense, this is F being dominated by G. You could write this as maybe F controlled by G in some sense. I'm not gonna use that notation. Just think of this as some control of F by G. And all of this is under the assumption that the vector space V is, yeah, can't type today. The vector space V is the cone of B minus the cone of A. Technical lemma, it'll come up later on. <coughs> so the proof, the proof that one implies two is actually fairly simple. And we're not actually going to use that one implies two, we're gonna use it two implies one. So we're gonna skip it. Uh, to show this domination of f by g, you can actually take the map phi and use all of the domination assumptions you have and the result just falls out. The hard part is finding the existence of phi once you have this domination of f by g. Two implies one is what we really want. So given this kind of a domination of f by g, how do we define a linear map phi with all of these properties, given that all of the information that we have is kind of sublinear? We don't have any really linear assumptions here. The answer is going to be Han Banach. Every time you want to construct a functional, you use the Han Banach theorem. And there is a Han Banach theorem for vector spaces. You don't actually need norm spaces. It's actually somewhat easier to prove the Han Banach theorem without norms because you don't need to prove continuity. So we're going to use that. But we have to set up a bit. So let's define a map P from the vector space into the extended reals that are not positive infinity. We're gonna possibly allow minus infinity here. We're gonna show that it doesn't come up in the end, but the way we define things could be negative infinity. P of V, where V is a vector, is defined to be the infimum of this quantity, B to M, G, B, M, minus the sum over N, alpha N, F, a n, the infimum of this thing over all representations of V as V being equal to the sum over M of B to M, G, B, M. Wait, no, no G here. B to M, B, M minus the sum over N of alpha N, A n. And this is a representation of V as being in the cone of B minus the cone of A. So what I mean by that is that the betas and the alphas are all non-negative. All of the A's are in capital A, all of the B's are in capital B. Because of the assumption that V is the cone of B minus the cone of A, such a representation always exists. So in particular, you know that this P of V is never infinity, never positive infinity. It could be negative infinity for all you know, but it's not gonna be positive infinity. So we define P like that. And what can we do with this P? We prove a bunch of properties. P 
is sublinear in the following sense. If you take a sum of two vectors, then P of that sum is less than or equal to P of V1 plus P of V2. And I won't write out the proof explicitly, but the whole point is that any representation, representations of V1 and V2 sum to give a representation of the sum V1 plus V2. So in particular, the set of representations of V1 plus V2 is small or larger in a sense than the sum of represent, than representations of V1 and representations of V2. So you're taking an infimum over a larger set, which gives you a smaller quantity. Inf over larger set. So you get that sublinearity. You can write it out explicitly if you want, but I don't want to. You have that P of lambda V is equal to lambda of PV for all V in the vector space for all lambda greater than zero. Because if you take a representation of V and you scale it by lambda, you get a representation of lambda V. So you're actually looking at infima over equal sets, basically. I won't write that out any more explicitly than that. And something that takes a small amount of proof is that P of the zero vector is zero. That's not so immediate. We will prove that one. How do we prove this? So to show that P of zero is less than or equal to zero, you notice that the zero vector can be written as zero B minus zero A for some A and A, B and B, or for all A and A and B and B. That's yeah, small A and large A. So this tells you that P of zero is no greater than, so what was the definition of P? Zero times G of B minus zero times F of A, which is zero using the definition of P. So you pick the, this sort of trivial zero representation of the zero vector and that tells you that P of zero is less than or equal to zero. As for the other direction, show that P of zero is greater than or equal to zero. If you can write zero as a sum, a finite sum, but I'm not gonna quantify everything. If you can write zero in this way, then you have that this sum over B or over M of the Bs is equal to the sum of the A's. And that's by the assumption that we have on F and G, this domination of F by G, you have, oops, this is less than or equal to that. Actually, in the assumption we make, we only need this inequality here to make that work, but inequality is stronger than that. And so this tells us that the sum over the Bs, wait, how do I want to do this? Minus, yeah, minus the sum over the A's is greater than or equal to zero. And that tells you that P of zero is greater than or equal to zero because you take the infimum over all such representations. Okay, so we know that P of zero is zero. So these properties that we've proven this sublinearity, this homogeneity with positive scalars and so on. This tells you that P is sublinear. Actually, no, I have one more thing to prove. I have to prove that it can't be minus infinity. Then we'll know that it's a truly a proper sublinear map into the reals. To show that P of every vector is greater than minus infinity for all V in the vector space, we use that zero is equal to P of zero, which is equal to P of V plus P of minus V. Using the, um, do we know this? It's, we don't know that that's equal to, we only use sublinearity that's less than or equal to P of V plus P of minus V, which tells you that neither of these can be minus infinity. Because if either of those are minus infinity, you would get that zero is less than or equal to minus infinity, which is pretty clearly a contradiction. 
So you get that P maps the vector space into the reals. Negative infinity is now excluded. And you know that it's sublinear. And now you can use the hahn barnack theorem for real vector spaces. So hahn barnack for real vector spaces says that there exists a linear map, capital Phi, on the vector space to the real line such that Phi of V is less than or equal to P of V for all V. That's what the hahn barnack theorem tells you in this case. If you can construct a sublinear, well, not a functional, but a sublinear map, then there exists a linear map that's dominated by that sublinear map. So using the definition of P, what does this tell us about the linear map phi? What do we need to prove about phi? Let's just remind ourselves of that. We want to show that F is dominated by phi on A and that G dominates phi on B. So let's prove this one. So what can we do? How do we do this? Fix a vector A in that set A, and then you can write minus A is equal to zero B minus one A for all B in the set B. So take a trivial representation of A as a, as a something in the cone of well, minus A as something in the cone of B minus the cone of A. This tells you that P of minus A is less than or equal to minus F of A by the definition of P. And this tells you that phi of minus A is less than or equal to P of minus A because the linear map phi is dominated by P by construction. And that's less than or equal to minus F of A. And now phi is linear, so we can take the signs out. And that tells you that phi of A, so if we put the minus out here, Phi of A is greater than or equal to F of A. And that's what we needed to show. Miracle this map P, what it does. And you can do pretty much the same thing on B. You want to show that G dominates Phi on B. You write B as equal to 1B minus 0A. <laughs> An even easier trivial representation because you don't need to negate the thing. So P of B is less than or equal to G of B. Am I doing this right? Yes, I am. And you know that phi of B is less than or equal to P of B. And that proves what we needed to show there. And that completes that proof. So it's a nice little technical lemma. It's all just linear. There's no norms, nothing Barnack here, except for the, the Han Barnack, which isn't due to Barnack anyway. Nothing ever is named after. If you name a theorem after someone, they didn't prove it, you know that. So what we have, just to remind ourselves, we can construct some linear maps from this kind of domination of F by G, which turns out to be pretty crucial, even if we don't quite understand what it means yet. And it, at this point, you really can't see what this would have to do with Kopien's theorem. But we need to somehow construct a Hilbert space that's isomorphic to a Barnack space. And a convenient way of constructing Hilbert spaces is to get linear maps with certain properties on certain spaces and use them to construct bilinear forms. That's what this argument is all going to be about. Once you've constructed a bilinear form, you can construct a Hilbert space. And if you've constructed it right, you're going to get some isomorphisms. So you're in condition two, or in the, the second equivalent statement of the lemma, you're assuming that alpha and a n is beta and b m, right? Sorry? You're assuming alpha and a n equals beta and b m or something? So no, just this inequality. For all, basically, whenever you have sequences, a dot, b dot, alpha dot, beta dot. Well, but I mean, if I can, ah, wait, no, no, I can't. I, I just thought, okay, then I can take alpha n and have it go to, wait, yeah, I can. Can I? Can I, can I just let alpha n be really, really, really large? And then conclude that f of a n must be zero, basically, for all a. Yeah, maybe I've missed an assumption here. 
Oh yeah, such that. Uh, in fact, even in the proof, you saw that I had to use something. Yeah. Yeah. No, I've completely skipped an assumption. Yeah. I don't know if you need the equality. I think you just need the inequality. But let's just, yeah, we should probably be assuming that. Why does the inequality in vector space? There is none. So let's make it equality. <laughs> what I've said didn't make a lot of sense. Yeah, we need this assumption here. That's kind of crucial to make the whole thing make mm -hmm. sense. Good diagnostics here. Um, another question. Yep. Is the, the assumption that the whole vector space is spanned in this way, is this actually necessary or is it just more like... A it is somewhat necessary, I think. I mean, if your B and A are too small, then you're not going to be able to construct a linear map on all of V, at least not yeah, but, in such a way I mean, that dominates F and G. Like, I think what you can... Intuitively, if they're like... Yeah, small, I see your point actually. You don't really need it. You can just, you can take just do whatever you want on the complement, right? Yeah, so, exactly. Yeah, it's not really that necessary. But I mean, it's That's it's not right. clear to me that it's not necessary. It might be for some technical reasons. The so I mean, you can always restrict to the span of the cones. Yeah, I think you can do that. Uh, since since you don't have negatives, the span of the cones will not be the same as the difference of the cones in general, I guess. So there that might could be, be an obstruction. Might be an obstruction coming in from there, but you don't know by chance if it really if there is a yeah. counterexample otherwise or something. I'm not sure to be honest. I don't really know a lot about this lemma. Like I only know it through this proof. So I haven't, you know, debugged it and done all the QA mm -hmm. on it, you know, tested it for as to see exactly what you can do with it. It works in this form. I, I think. I think you're right. Like, I think it doesn't really depend that much on that assumption. Like, I think in some sense, you can always take a span of cone of B minus cone of A. It might not be the span or something. It might be some thinking where there's some different span that makes sense there. That's a good question. I don't know the answer to it. I would say that I'll think about it and get back to you, but this is the last lecture, so I can't do that. <laughs> Have a think about it yourself. Uh, I mean, this lemma is probably not the most important theorem in all of no, finite it's values not. analysis. It's, it's not really, no. I guess it's just something yeah, it's an auxiliary in this case, And so it's yeah. sufficient to have it in this form, I guess. Yeah, what's more interesting is what you can do with it than how much you can just extend that lemma in itself. But yeah, good question, I agree. Here's the proposition, which is the really important one. I think this is due to Moray, one of the big guys in functional analysis and UMD stuff and all of that. Uh, Co-authored a lot of stuff with Pizier. <laughs> Incidentally, there's a lot of Moray Pizier theorems. This is the, the thing we're going to prove, which is actually stronger than the Quapian theorem. So this is the real interesting content. Let X and Y be Banach spaces. Real or complex. Let T be a linear map from X to Y. And let C be some positive constant. Then the following are equivalent. We have a lot of equivalences today that we're only going to prove one direction of because we only need one, the hard direction of them. So the thing we will want to prove is that there exists a Hilbert space H and operators that are bounded linear operators. There's an operator R from X to H, and there's an operator S from H to Y, such that you have commutativity of this diagram, or if you don't like commutative diagrams, and everyone likes commutative diagrams, T equals the composition SR, and such that the norm of S as an operator times the norm of R is less than or equal to C. So what this means, or what you would say here, is that the operator T factors through a Hilbert space. Now this is a, a nice, strong operator theoretic property for the operator T. And this is a factorizer. I think this is sometimes called the Moray factorization theorem. I'm not sure about that. But this is a theorem about when you, when you can factorize an operator between Banach spaces through a Hilbert space characterizes exactly when that happens. The thing that's equivalent that we're going to verify 
for all finite sequences. Xm and Yn in the Banach space X. Satisfying the assumption that the sum over N, I'm going to say something that for all functionals in X dual, if you can dominate the sequence Y by the sequence X, in this dual sense where you test them all against a functional and take this L2 sum. Ah, right, Christoph's here. Hey, Christoph. Right, if for, all, if for all finite sequences in X, such that you have this domination against every functional in X dual, we have this domination, or this sort of boundedness property of T. All right. This is the kind of estimate that you would get on an operator T if it were an operator between Hilbert spaces. You'd be able to prove that sort of thing using orthogonality. And trivially, an operator between Hilbert spaces factors through a Hilbert space. Just take the identity operator on either side. You're fine, All right? If you have this kind of orthogonality-like property that you can get from T, then you can, this happens if and only if T actually factorizes through a Hilbert space. So you can only get this Hilbert looking property if there is actually a Hilbert space hidden in the background of your operator. That's a way to think of this. Uh, Christoph, did you see the previous lemma? I don't think you were here during that. You're muted. I just came in uh, two minutes ago, only saw this page here. Let me just quickly show you the previous lemma. Not the Glad to be lemma. back, by the way. Sorry. I oh, yeah, you missed a few times. Times. Really, really, Yeah. <laughs> what we're proving is Krapien's theorem, type two and co-type two equivalent mm -hmm. to isomorphic to a Hilbert space. Here's the cone of a set. You know what the cone of a set is, I think, in a real yes. space. But I don't know the Krapien. What's Krapien? The put on the Krapien again. Yeah. We showed on... Um, Tuesday that Fourier oh. type two, so the Plancharel theorem implies Radomacher type two and co-type two. Yes. And now we're going to show that this actually implies okay. that the Banach space is isomorphic to a Hilbert space. All right. Mm -hmm. The technical lemma, which you can quickly read, if you've got sets A and B inside a real vector space, which generate V in the sense that V is the cone of B minus the cone of A. If you've got functions F and G on A and B with no assumptions, then following your equivalent, there's a linear map on V which dominates F and is dominated by G on A and B. Mm -hmm. And this kind of domination of F by G for all sequences such that this property is true. Okay. Yep. Well, that you proved. We proved that. That's, now you're you, okay. That follows from Han Banach for real vector spaces. You okay. construct a, yes. a, a okay. sublinear map P and you're good. Mm -hmm. You just have to show it's sublinear. <laughs> okay. So we'll go to the Moray theorem. Yes. Yep. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And that's probably good for the students as well, although there's not that many today. <laughs> Only <laughs> the best students are here today and they, they follow everything. They they're, don't even need to be they're here. doing they're carnival right? or what is the reason? Is there a carnival thing today? Is there? I don't they know. Or is it over? It's Weiber Fastnacht, but I'm not sure if anything is happening. Weiber Fastnacht, what happens on that? Nothing, right? Um, I'm not from this region originally, uh, I didn't grow up with it. I'm not quite sure, yeah. But... I, I never really was interested in that either, but I think it's usually at least there is some kind of activity and I think some town hall is being stormed and- uh, the Town hall is being stormed, that's topical. And a regional holiday. <laughs> and every, uh, every other thing is canceled and People don't have to go to work or something. Uh, but now in Corona times, I'm not sure how they're going to do anything. Well, all I know is I'm going to blast carnival music out of my window for a week. <laughs> Culture Jung, all week. None of the non-Germans know what I'm talking about. In fact, they're probably not even all the Germans know what I'm talking about. <laughs> anyway, let's do a proof. Yep. 
prove the Murray theorem. We're just going to prove that two implies one, even though they're equivalent. One implies two is the easier direction. There's a little bit of argument involving ortho orthonormal bases, but nothing too tricky. Like if you know that there's a Hilbert space, you can prove this property. The harder part is constructing the Hilbert space. You, you would have guessed that, right? So two implies one. We're going to separate off the real and complex cases because the arguments Okay, the argument is still basically the same, but we deduce it from the real case because the lemma is for real Barnack spaces because we use order properties, All right? Case one, X is a real Barnack space. And this is a, it's a fantastic argument. You know how I keep saying about Barnack valued analysis, the whole problem is you can't multiply vectors. That's really the biggest problem. The way this proof works is it introduces a way of multiplying vectors. <laughs> This proves me wrong. We let f, curly f of x star be the real vector space, which is a set of all functions, nothing but measurability, all functions f from x star into the real line. And this is a real vector space. And you can multiply elements of it because you can pointwise multiply functions. All right. Now for all vectors in X, we're gonna define an element of this real vector space. We're gonna call it X hat, just because that's what the book calls it. X hat in F of X star, doing kind of the only thing it possibly could. X hat on a functional X star is given by the action of X star against X. And that's real. So we have the set of all functions in the dual space and every vector in the original space gives a function on the dual space. So we can embed X within this real vector space F of X star. Now you consider the subspace, which we call V of this space of functions. V is the span of all functions of the form X hat, Y hat where X and Y are in X. Because you can do pointwise multiplication of functions on X star and get a function on X star. X hat, Y hat of X star is simply X hat of X star times Y hat of X star. It's just a space of functions. You have multiplication on spaces of functions. So we take the span of all I was going to say squares. We are going to apply it to squares where we take x equals y, but all products of, of these functions. This gives you an artificial way of multiplying vectors in the space. It takes you out of the space, but you can multiply them. Now this v is going to be applied in this. We're going to use v in this lemma that we proved before. So we need sets a and b. And a will actually be equal to b in this case. And we're taking the set of squares squares coming from single elements of the original vector space, the original Barnack space, I should say. That's a subset of B, of course, taking X equal Y. And for every X and Y in X, we can write using a kind of polarization identity. X hat, Y hat is actually equal to one quarter of x hat plus y hat squared minus x hat minus y hat squared. Fairly straightforward identity to prove. And that gives you an element of the cone of B minus the cone of A. Cone A. Right, does that make sense? So this tells you once you take spans that V is actually the cone of B minus the cone of A. So the main assumption, or one of the assumptions of the lemma is already satisfied here. We still need to define functions F and G. So F maps A to R. A is the set of squares. So we just need to say what happens on every square. F of a square will be given by the norm of TX squared in Y. And G 
also only needs to be defined on squares. And that will be this constant C squared times the norm of X squared, or well, the norm of X in X squared. Now, I think here's a good time to remind ourselves of what we're trying to prove because it's easy to forget what we're trying to prove in this theorem. We have the assumption two. So we have this inequality for certain sequences of vectors. And you see the things on the left-hand side are having to do with this function f. And the things on the right-hand side are this function g, basically. So we're choosing functions f and g that are related to this inequality that we have. And we're going to try to construct the Hilbert space from that. That's the, the goal. So that's where f and g come from. So we want to show by the lemma that there exists a linear map phi such that f of the square of x hat is less than or equal to phi of the square of x hat, and that will be less than or equal to g of the square of x hat. So what f is, let's just write this out, t of x squared, and this will be c squared, norm of x squared. So what we're doing here with this lemma is we're going to show that there's a linear map phi that sits between the left-hand side and the right-hand side of our inequalities in some sense. And this phi is going to let us construct the Hilbert space that we need. It's all a bit mysterious at the moment, but it will make more sense as you go on. So to use that lemma, what we need to check, we need to verify the following property. If you have this identity here, This is the identity that's in this lemma. Uh, squares don't appear in a lemma, but positive coefficients appear in a lemma and every positive coefficient is a square. So I can write it without loss of generality with squares for the alphas and betas. Assuming that we need to have this control of F by G. We need to show this implication. So let's call this A. From A, what we get, this is an equality of functions on X star. So this is equality in F X star. So that means when you test it against every element of X star, you get this identity. So we get for all X star in the dual of X, you will have using the definition of y hat and x hat. You get that. Or written somewhat differently, alpha n y n against x star equals beta m x m against x star, everything squared. So we'll get that. And this is precisely the kind of thing that we can put into the assumption, this assumption two that we're assuming. So remember, we're proving two implies one, two says whenever you have this kind of equality, you will get this boundedness property of T. So we have that property. So therefore, by assumption two that we assume, sum of n T alpha n y n norm squared is less than or equal to c squared times the norm of beta m x m in x squared. And when you rewrite that, you take the alpha n's out. This is f of y n. Take the betas out and this is g of x n oh, squared. I have to put squares here by definition. And that's what we needed to show.
So the assumptions or the hypotheses of the lemma are verified for this particular, these functions f and g, these sets b and a. So phi exists with the property up here. It satisfies this. And this is for all x in x. Pretty good, right? We use this great theorem for real vector spaces with no norms to prove something about linear maps. Now this phi is just linear, actually. This phi is, there's nothing about boundedness here. Phi is a linear map on a real vector space with no norms. And it's sandwiched between these norms. <laughs> Quite nice. Let's construct H. Hilbert space H that the map T has to factorize through. Let's define a bilinear map. Uh, bilinear form, sorry. On X, this bilinear form of X, Y is defined to be capital Phi of the vector X hat, Y hat. So we constructed phi such that it's got these nice properties on squares, but now we're going to apply it to non-squares. This is a, another polarization type thing. I won't check that it's a bilinear form, but it is a bilinear form. That just comes from linearity of capital phi. And we define an associated seminorm. Whenever you have a bilinear form, you get a seminorm P of X is the bilinear form of x against x to the one half. It has all the properties of the norm except for positive definiteness. It could be zero without the vectors being zero. That's why it's a semi-norm. But whenever you have a semi-norm, there's an associated norm on a different vector space. We define a real vector space x zero which is X modulo the kernel of P. So you take all of the things which have zero seminorm and quotient them out. We were talking about quotient spaces before the lecture started. So it's good that this quotient space comes up. Quotient spaces are the best construction in all of mathematics. I will make that plain. There'd be no math without quotient spaces. I hope everybody knows what a quotient space is. <laughs> X zero is a quotient space of X by the kernel of P and then pretty much trivially, this seminorm P is a norm on X zero because you've quotiented out by all of the obstructions to it being a norm. So now we have a norm vector space uh, with norm coming from a bilinear form. <laughs> this pretty much looks like a Hilbert space, right? Take H to be X zero with completion with respect to this norm because the space might not be complete. We just take an abstract completion. Then this bilinear form induces an inner product on H. That inner product gives you the norm because P induces a norm. Okay, all of these things cooperate properly. And then H is a Hilbert space. Okay, I haven't said that this inner product actually gives you the same norm, but you can see that that's true. Before I took the completion, all of this was fine. This, um, yeah, I've got, a, I've got a norm here. This norm is actually coming from an induced bilinear form. So this X zero is already a pre-Hilbert space. It has an inner product, but it's not necessarily complete. You just complete everything to get a Hilbert space. So we have a Hilbert space now. It's a very abstract Hilbert space, but it exists. I did use the hahn barnack theorem to show that it exists. So the set theorists will get angry at me, but I don't think there are any in the audience. I know Sebastian likes a bit of set theory, but you know, he's okay with the axiom of choice. So we have a Hilbert space. We need to define the, the maps into and out of the Hilbert space that give us the factorization of T. So we define a map R from X into H. And this is just a quotient map. It sends a vector X into x modulo the kernel of p. 
remembering that x0 is actually just x modulo the kernel of p, so we can do that. We take an equivalence class of x, and we're actually mapping into the completion, so we're mapping into a larger space, so this is perfectly well defined. This is linear, trivially, and for boundedness, because we have to check boundedness here, the norm of Rx in the Hilbert space H is P of X, where P is this norm, actually the semi-norm. This is phi of X hat squared to the one half by the definition of P. And because phi is dominated by the function G that we constructed earlier, what we get is that phi of X hat squared is less than C of the norm of X by the construction of phi. So R is bounded nicely. It's actually got norm less than or equal to C. Now we need to define another map that goes out of H. And we're gonna start by defining it out of X zero and then do all the quotient stuff and the completions. So we define S, well, let's write it consistently. S is mapping X zero into X. So the elements of X zero are, are quotients, uh, cosets, sorry, equivalent classes. So X modulo the kernel of P, we're going to map that into TX, where T is the map that we started with. Is this well-defined? We have to check that. Because the representation for what S is doing to an equivalent class uses the representative. And whenever you do that, you have to make sure that the thing is actually independent of the representative. So for it to be well-defined, if you have X and Y such that the difference is in the kernel of P, we need to show that S of X is equal to S of Y. So let's take S of X minus S of Y in X. This is T of X minus Y. By definition, I'm going to put squares just to make everything a bit easier. We know that T of a vector in norm is dominated by phi of that vector squared. Alex? Yep. Shouldn't the, the set of arrival of S be uh, Y? I'm sorry? Shouldn't, I mean, S should be from X0 to Y, no? It should, indeed. That's just a typo. It's also um, wrong in my notes. So <laughs> my written notes. Yeah, it should map to Y, of course. So this X should be Y. This X should be Y. There we go. Is that better? Perfect. Right, so the norm of T squared of a vector is dominated by phi of that vector hat squared by construction. And this is P of x minus y hat, x minus y hat. Wait, do I need hats here? No, no, no. P of x minus y, x minus y. And because we assume that x minus y is in the kernel of P, that tells you that this is zero. So S is well-defined. There's probably a, an abstract way of just seeing that, but I thought I'd give the details. We need to show that S is bounded. So if we take S of an equivalence class in Y, that's just the norm of TX in Y. That is bounded by phi. So what this is bounded by is, is bounded by P of X. Hang on, is that true? It's P, uh, I've, just got, I've confused myself for some reason. Yeah, okay, yep. I did that in the previous line over here, actually. That's bounded by P of X. And this is the norm of X mod kernel of P in X zero by the definition of X zero. I'm just confusing myself with this proof. I wrote it down really badly on paper. So, 
So this tells you that S is bounded and the norm of S is less than or equal to one. So we define S bar to be the extension of S to a continuous linear map from H to Y. Because remember H was actually the completion of X zero with respect to the norm P. So we can automatically extend any bounded linear map from a space to its completion. So we just do that. And it doesn't change its norm. The norm is still less than or equal to one. Now for all X in X, S R of X, we want to show that this is equal to T of X. We want to show that we've actually factorized T. This is pretty much automatic. This is S of X modulo the kernel of P by the definition of R. And this is T of X by the definition of S. And finally, the norm of S times the norm of R is less than or equal to C, which is something we also wanted to prove as well. And we're done. So we proved the hard direction of the Moro factorization theorem. It was um, not that hard, it used properties of real vector spaces, but it was pretty subtle proof, you gotta admit, right? So I have a question. Oh, I haven't done the, I haven't done the complex case. Sorry, that was only the real case. <laughs> we're not done. I'm gonna sketch how to prove, you have the question there. Yeah. yeah, I'm just curious. So you, you constructed this, this, the construction of this phi was the hard part, right? Pretty much, yeah. And it was squeezed. There was this one yellow, uh, can you go back to this yellow thing where you squeeze it between right there, I guess. Yep. Just, it's behind my faces. Uh, wait. I'm just, so this constant C was the assumption of the original theorem right it could yep. in principle be one if you've got one then what's going to happen is these s and r their norms are going to be less than or equal to one when you take the product and what that's actually going to show is that x and y are going to have to be not hilbert spaces themselves but the maps are going to be very hilbertian yeah i'm wondering does the whole proof simplify if this constant c is one or no you just if you have a constant there in the assumption then you propagate that constant through to the conclusion that's right, but if yeah, oh, oh, I see. Sorry, I'm, I'm misreading yeah. it. Yeah, no, if you yeah. okay, no, it's not the the left hand side is not the same as the right hand side. So you're not going to have identities just because the constant is one. Okay, so yeah. that's what I was mistaking. Yeah, no, then yeah. the constant is just one. It doesn't help at all. No, I think you can say something a little bit stronger when the constant's one. Like, I don't know enough about operator theory to say what's really going to happen here, but the maps are essentially Hilbertian in that sense. And it's like, I don't know if that implies that X and Y are Hilbert spaces, but you've got to be pretty close to it for that to happen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, I think the constant doesn't really matter because we can put the constant in the T, right? Yeah. You can do that too. You can renormalize T, but then yeah, I think I S and R are going to have to distort things a bit as well. I think I was misreading something. I'm not sure the, con the value of the constant is that important. It's not that important, but if you want to do really quantitative things, I guess it is. The thing that this, well, this inequality here is really measuring how much S and R are distorting things. Right? Yes, yes, yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. You can always take, <laughs> just as a, an example, take X to be a Hilbert space and then take a direct sum with your favorite bad Barnock space. And Y can be the same Hilbert space tensor with anything you want. Let's take another bad Barnock space, the same one. Well, let's take a different one, L1. And then you take a map from the Hilbert space to itself. And then you take T tilde to be T direct sum the zero map. So that just does nothing on the, the bad part. And then you have a map that's just, it's gonna have all these Hilbertian properties and basically it's image and it, it's domain and co-domain, like all of the part that's important is Hilbert spaces, right? So. You can certainly have constant one for a non-trivial map on a very bad Barnack space to another very bad Barnack space. But the way that I constructed that is I took something very good and then just made it trivial on the rest of the space. Well, you could you could make C one and then you could somehow normalize T as well to the yeah. norm one or something and then would that uh... Uh, you would you have to have this over all yeah, no, I think you can do that. I don't see why not over all collections of vectors. If you had that C that worked for all, yeah, you can renormalize T, but then S and R are gonna get distorted accordingly. Yeah, okay, yeah. okay. Yeah. 
Anyway, you did see not a big deal. Suggest that if there's a sharp estimate, then you have a more thorough information. Such you as should, yeah. Yeah. But I don't know, to be honest, how much. Like you can ask. Yeah, yeah okay, I won't go too far on that because yeah, I don't okay, yeah, I'm going to say things that are wrong if I keep talking about that. <laughs> well, now I think we exhausted what we could quickly say. That's right. Yeah. yeah. By the way, do we need a break or should we just run through straight to the end? Because there's not that much left. However you like. Yeah, let's, let's do a five minute break in case anybody needs to go to the toilet or something. Yeah. Back in five minutes. Just a quick one. All right. We haven't done the complex case. And I'm not really going to fill out the proof for the complex case. It's just a matter of reduction to the real case. Case where X is a complex finite space. It's essentially a real proof. That's the thing. Like, so you have to reduce it down. I'm really just going to sketch it. The details are not that. I'm going to give the interesting details because most of the details are not that interesting. You let X sub R be the real Banach space underlying X. Which is actually just the same set, but you forget that you can multiply by complex numbers. The reals are contained in the complex numbers. So, you know. Then you have an associated real dual space. And the thing is the condition of being real linear for a functional says on the one hand, okay, you can only map into the real numbers, but on the other hand, you don't have to have as much linearity because you can't, you don't have as many scalars to multiply by. So the real dual space isn't exactly the same as the complex dual space. And the assumptions that we have on X involve testing against all functionals in the complex dual. So what you need to do is verify the assumption on the real dual. And that's just a matter of reducing down to real and imaginary parts. You can do that. I'm not going to give the details of that. So fairly quickly, you can check, okay, if you take the underlying real space, then your underlying real assumptions are satisfied. So you get your bilinear form from before. And it's real bilinear. It satisfies all the assumptions you need it to satisfy. The thing you need to do is construct a, it's a sesquilinear form. So not a C bilinear form, but one that's linear in the first variable, conjugate linear in the second. So you construct a C, well, I won't say C sesquilinear, just construct the sesquilinear form square brackets on X. So not the real space, this is on the real space and this is on X say X sub C, just to emphasize that it's a complex binary space. The way you construct that is pretty standard. You basically average over phases like this. D theta. And you check that that gives you a sesquilinear form. It does. Standard. Given a bilinear form, this will give you a sesquilinear form. I won't check the details there. You define your semi-norm using the sesquilinear form instead of the bilinear one. And the only real thing you need to check is that this semi-norm is dominated by the norm of X. And this is just Happens like so. This is already real number, so you can put in that real part. By the definition of that, I'm just being very sketchy here. When you reduce down to the bilinear form, you take that real part, the second part drops out because that's purely imaginary. This is less than or equal to the average of C squared norm of E to the I theta X in X. And that phase doesn't affect the norm of the vector. So this gives you C squared or norm of X squared. So at least this norm P that you construct has the right estimates. And you proceed as before. And the rest of the proof is exactly the same. So that's just the skeleton of how you reduce down to the real case. You have to verify the real assumptions. You get a bilinear form 
average that to get a sesquilinear form and you're good. Everything works. Now I've said, this page of my notes is what I did on Tuesday as a bonus. We talked a bit about Gaussian sums on Tuesday. I'm gonna just quickly go over it again, just because we're gonna need it. Theorem one about Gaussian sums. If X has finite cotype, then Rademacher averages in X are equivalent to Gaussian averages. I'll just quickly write that out. So if you have a Rademacher average, oops, we can put P's here. This will be equivalent. This is for all P less than infinity. This is really just for the benefit that pe for people that weren't here on Tuesday, which is Christoph and maybe others I can't remember. So what you have here is a Gaussian average where these gamma n's are uh, independent, identically distributed, standard normal variables. So Gaussians. And these can be real or complex valued because you have real Gaussians and also complex Gaussians. So there's a whole thing of Gaussian sums that parallels Rademacher sums. And as long as your Barnack space has finite Rademacher cotype, they're the same thing. There's no difference. But for certain theorems, Gaussian sums work better. And for certain Barnack spaces, Gaussian sums are not equivalent to Rademacher sums, the ones that don't have finite cotype. This is actually if and only if, although I haven't said that explicitly. I think that's if and only if, don't quote me on that. The cotype is there to take care of the Gaussian tiles. Tiles? The Sorry. tails? Oh, tails. <laughs> um, so. Yeah, basically. The, the problem is that Gaussian random variables are not bounded. Right. Yeah. They're, they're symmetric, but they're not bounded. And since it's so rapidly decaying, it doesn't matter what the code type is. Unless the Barnack space is really bad. <laughs> That's the thing. So if you have Barnack spaces like L infinity that don't have finite co type, yeah, yeah. then you won't have this equivalence anymore. Right. Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. In general, you have this theorem where the Gaussians can be replaced by any symmetric bounded random variable, and you don't need any assumption on the Barnack space. But once the random variable stops being bounded, right. you need extra yeah, yeah. assumptions. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So the reason we need this is for this covariance domination. It's covariance domination for Gaussian random sums, which works in every Barnack space, but only for Gaussian sums, which is if you have an estimate of this form, which we've seen in the Moray theorem, for all continuous linear functionals in the dual of X for some sequence of vectors Xn and Xy. And for all P less than infinity, you have control of one Gaussian sum by the other. With constant one. Uh, wait. I've confused my M's and N's, it doesn't really matter. Gamma N, Y N. So this covariance domination is a sufficient condition for boundedness of one Gaussian sum by another. And if you have equivalence of Gaussian sums and Rademacher sums, this tells you when one Rademacher sum is bounded by another, which is very handy. Like this, this condition here turns out to be much stronger than domination of a Gaussian sum, which means it usually doesn't hold, but sometimes it does. And when it does, then you get this nice domination of random sums. All right. We did that very quickly on Tuesday. I'm not going to prove either of these. I didn't prove them on Tuesday either. Unfortunately, I don't have time. We'd have to go into the theory of Gaussian sums a bit more, and that would take at least another day, another lecture, which we don't have. So finally, let's prove the Quapian theorem. So we have a Barnack space with Rademacher type two and cotype two. So in particular, it's got finite cotype. So the equivalence of Gaussian and Rademacher sums applies. What we're going to do 
is we're going to consider the identity map. We want to show that it factorizes through Hilbert space using the Quapien condition. That's going to do the job for us. Uh, if we know that we can find a Hilbert space H and linear maps R and S, which factorize the identity map. So if we know there exists such a diagram, then we have that X is isomorphic to SR of H. So this map SR, which is mapping H to itself, this is actually a projection. This is all pretty standard. SR squared is SR, SR, and RS is the identity. So this is SR. So we have this projection from H onto itself, which will give you a, a closed subspace of the Hilbert space, and that's the and that's going to be a Hilbert space as well. And that's going to be isomorphic to X. The isomorphism is R. And the inverse is S. And should I check the details that that's actually an isomorphism, or do you just believe me? I guess you believe me. Okay. I believe you, yeah. Good. Oh, yeah. It's not an orthogonal projection, is it? Doesn't need to be. I don't think it is, though. Yeah. There's no, no it's, it's not map. There's nothing extra on these maps, so I don't think we can force it to be orthogonal, but it doesn't matter. If it were an orthogonal projection, it would have norm one. And this doesn't necessarily have norm one. Uh, OK. Yeah. So X will, yeah, if we can get this factorization of the identity map, we're done. We have we need to... SR of H or RS of H? Because S maps from H to X, right? Not yeah, R. this is the way I'm thinking of it. So R maps X to H, S maps H to X, and SR maps H to itself. Wait, hang on, RS. I have... I always get the S then R, so that's RS, right? Yeah, I always get this backwards. Better. And let's hang on, I've done SR, so that should be RS, shouldn't it? Yeah, it's all backwards. Yeah, okay. This stupid right to left notation for composition is not good anyway. So I got confused, where was I? Okay, so what do we need to show? We need to verify the hypothesis of the, of the Moray theorem. We need to show for all finite sequences such that you have this kind of domination all x star in the dual we then have this domination of the identity map with some constant that i don't care about so i'm not going to write it right this would be the hypothesis hypothesis of the of the moray theorem so let's call this a and let's assume A and let's start to prove what we want to prove. So what do we know about such a sum? Let's take square roots. The assumption is that X has type and cotype two. And this says that little L2 sums can, are equivalent to Radomacher sums. So this little L2 sum using cotype two is equivalent to a Radomacher sum. By finite cotype, this is equivalent to a Gaussian sum. By a covariance domination using the assumption, we can bound that by another Gaussian sum. That's the sum over M, 
with the X factors. That's why I needed to introduce Gaussian sums. <laughs> then I take that Gaussian sum and I say, right, that's still equivalent to a Rademacher sum. So let's put the Rademachers back. And we have that X has type two. So this Rademacher sum is equivalent to an L2 sum, or bounded by an L2 sum. Which is what we needed to show. So the hypotheses of Moray's theorem are verified. So the identity operator factors through a Hilbert space and therefore the Banach space that you started with is isomorphic to a possibly different Hilbert space, a projection of the original one. And that completes the proof of Grappian's theorem. So in a very roundabout way, we've proven this corollary, the important one. If X satisfies Plancherel's theorem, a natural Fourier analytic theorem. This can be either on the real line or on the integers or on the torus because it's whether or not you've got Plancherel theorem and one of these is equivalent to the others by what we did on Tuesday. Well, X satisfies Plancherel's theorem on one of these spaces if and only if X is isomorphic to a Hilbert space. Great. Which was the first theorem I talked about in this course and it's the last theorem I talk about in this course and I think I'm done at this point. So. Thanks for listening. <laughs> Any questions? Thank you. I was hoping I'd have more questions at the end. <laughs> Let's check my notes. Is there anything left? No, that's it. Any comments? The course is done now, so. Oh, just remind me when are our, are our exams next week or the week after? Week after next. The week after, that's yeah. good. Next week I have a lot of other things. Yeah, but that yeah. should be fine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have another office hour tomorrow and I'm gonna do a bonus one next week because I didn't do last week's. So, good to know. Yeah, I should give some sort of overview now of what we did in the course, just because that's a natural thing to do, right? Although I'm not really <laughs> sure where to begin. Or you should just relax. You have done a great just job. Relax. I've done yeah, enough. Like, so. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, and we we got through the entire course without Zoom cutting out once. Yes. How's that? No serious technical difficulties at all. <laughs> <laughs>